Okay, so this one, um, you guys are guinea pigs today. <laughs> this is this is a new presentation that I've put That's together. Um, as you might imagine, quite a few people are asking to try and understand what the new regs mean against yeah. some, of the, some of the criteria. So um, you were the first one that's been presented to. So I was uh, spent the last uh, week or so spending some time trying to put together this in a hopefully a not too tedious way. These things can you can get bogged down in the in the numbers and the dotting of i's and crossing of t's but i think fundamentally i want to make this presentation just about um and i think this is what you guys wanted to understand and do correct me if i'm wrong um yeah you, you know how, how far are the new regs going and given the, the way that reba 2030 is is kind of made up of various bits and bobs you know how do those relate and in the grand scheme of things um in, in fact kind of looking out really to to the end of the decade i've got in here you know how does it how does it relate and, and and how far is it going? So we'll see how we uh, we'll see how we get on. Um, just by way, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with the, the work that you guys do. Obviously, you, you work with us on domestic projects. Mm. Um, have you guys, as a practice, um, committed to the the climate challenge or architects declare or any kind of you know? To, is the practice kind of committed to moving itself forward in a in a meaningful way? You just kind of seeing seeing what clients are up for. Um, we've always pushed the sustainability agenda with all our clients. Yeah. Um, the challenge uh, sometimes is cost and 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 build and mm. other things like that. But mm. we always push and advocate, um, yeah. and we use we like, we like to use sort of timber and, and employ. You know, look at look right sizes of openings. And, yeah. um, we're not signed up, to my knowledge, to any um, architects declare or anything unless Tim knows otherwise. Um, he's here here before me. No. Unless uh, we sign up to some Reba practice, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Our, our project at Samark and has been in a lot of publications mm -hmm. promoting retrofit. Retrofit. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean Letty have obviously come out with guidance recently, and there's been various practice guides and, and stuff that have been coming out. Uh, I mean, are you guys familiar with the the, the Reba 2030 framework, which? You know, have you watched other webinars on what we were twenty third the climate challenge is, is about and the, the quadrants of it? Is that familiar to um, people in the practice at the moment? A quick reminder would be good. For is some is of the us right here, answer because that's exactly what you're yeah. going to get. A quick reminder yeah. to the Reba twenty thirty yeah. climate challenge. Okay, yeah. well I'll, um, I'll 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 dive in. And um, there's a couple of intro slides. Um, and uh, as I say, uh, hopefully you guys quite widely uh, 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 aware of what we're doing um this is just a kind of a, a standard admin slide what we're trying what we're trying to do i mean given it's a small group of people it's not so important but if you do think of any amazing questions bang them in the chat box and we'll, we'll we'll tend to answer them at the end so we can kind of get through the bulk of the content and of course we'll open it up it's not going to be a, like a super duper long uh webinar so hopefully there's a um you know, there's a there's time for chat at the end um, yeah. just about mics on mute and all the kind of stuff and we are recording this um so and the other thing to mention i don't know if you guys um follow some of the stuff that we're doing on on social media but we've got this meshwork platform which we launched in april we're now pushing about 900 members on it and this is everything from architects to surveyors to installers to um, well, kind of, uh, almost, I'm sure almost everybody on there is a homeowner um, and, and a whole real mix of experts and people who are trying to learn. And it, it's, it's a, essentially it's a free like collaboration platform where we can share, you know, what we're what we're learning and and ask questions, you know. So if we if we come up against things on, on projects or new regulation comes out or something, you know, a new design guide gets released, that, that kind of information gets widely shared on there. So if you guys aren't familiar with that, that's what we're doing. And, and there's a many, many, many people joining each and every day. As I say it's completely free. So if you go to our website or, or type in Meshwork, um, it, it takes seconds to, to sign in and, and there's a whole load of resources load of CPDs and, and other expert kind of videos and stuff that we're we're putting on there. And that's, um, we're investing quite a bit of time in that. And we've got a cat who's our kind of dedicated guardian of it, um, is always really happy to kind of show you around and, uh, and say, answer any questions. So do, it's, it's pretty cool and, and do check that out. The diversity is incredible, but the, the aim is to share information, collaborate, point people in the right direction and just help us all kind of learn quicker. Um, this kind of rapid sustainability movement that's coming. So do do check that out. Um, 
I won't go into what we do. I think you guys know fundamentally we're independent and we're just trying to make sustainable projects more successful. Um, so what we'll cover in, in the short little uh, CPD is we'll look at REBA 2030 climate challenge as a, as a super duper quick overview. We'll look at the new building regulations and what's changing uh, in regard to um, overheating, um, some of the ventilation and the uh, you know energy efficiency <clears throat> elements of it, which are, are most related to um, REBA 2030. Then we'll look at how they compare against themselves, but also the future home standard and, 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 and you know, passive house and stuff like that. So where they sit, where they sit in this big kind of sliding scale. And then we'll have to look at some of the kind of practical, practical implications. So the building regs are improving. What does that actually mean for U values, for ventilation rates, typically speaking, to kind of give you an idea of what's, what's being tweaked and what relatively minor adjustments you need to make to, uh, to, to get there. And then we'll, we'll summarise at the end. So start as a starter for 10, <coughs> um, the REBA climate challenge has actually been modified once since it first came out. The adjustments came out last year and um, they, the, the, the four main quadrants of the climate challenge remain unchanged. So you've got four, four parts to the climate challenge. One is, which is this kind of lightning bolt here, is the operational energy. And the idea of that is once you get to the, the, the kind of the REBA 2030 um, climate target, you'll have, you'll have um, reduced operational, typical operational energy usage of that dwelling compared to today's standards, not these new standards, but the new, the current regs, you'll have reduced operational energy by 60%. If you um, look at embodied carbon, which is one of the other main quadrants, that will have been reduced by about 40% on today's standards. This uh, dollop here is potable water usage. So again, it's looking at reducing um, water usage per person per day by 40% on, on today's uh, standards. And this, this heart symbol with a heartbeat in there, this is really a, a big focus on health and well-being, and most notably ventilation and overheating. So these are the four kind of main pillars of what is seen by the RIBA and increasingly the wider design community as as, as, as fundamentals to holistic design. Um, and version two of this challenge looked at um, breaking down the building type slightly differently. When this first came out, there were, there were two types of building, basically houses and everything that wasn't a house. And they had, they had different um, targets because of the way that the buildings have been used. As you'll see, they've actually, in version two, they broke this out to houses, schools and offices. So they, they broke the non-domestic part out into two and again gave you a bit more um, information on, on these four quadrants for schools and, 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 and other non-domestic buildings. We don't think this is going to change this year again or anytime soon, so this is kind of quite, quite settled. There were also adjustments made to the embodied carbon targets in version two because, bizarrely, they thought they were too strict. I, I think personally they were probably bob on um, and they got relaxed too much but powers that be the, the the group that got together thought thought that was uh, that was necessary um and they also moved the targets so although this this challenge got announced a couple of years ago um what was business as usual two years ago has has been moved forward so in the revised version it's 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 just kind of brought it more up to date and it's also got this really cool kind of climate challenge checklist at the end which is more kind of things to do to kind of help you think uh, about all these holistic elements. So do check it out. It's a downloadable PDF, um, dead, dead simple. And this graphic they updated as well. They had these really, really difficult to follow graphic. And, and even so, you know, as, as you guys as kind of visual professionals, <laughs> this is still fairly confusing. Um, but the gist is, the gist is we're kind of here at the moment and it's unsustainable to keep designing like that. They're suggesting that you design as a bare minimum for REBA 2025 for any new buildings now. And really, ideally, you should be aiming for REBA 2030 um, if you want to be in that kind of upper 20% of practices that you know are, are really are really kind of pushing. Um, and yeah, all the gradated colors, I don't quite know what value that's kind of adding. Um, and <laughs> the idea is the idea is that we do this way, way, way before 2030. So although they've got a 2030 target in it, you really need to be doing this like in the next year or so 
um, getting to this standard in order by the time those end buildings end up getting delivered and lived in and things, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're either on the curve or ahead of the curve of where we need to be. So that, that's, that, that was a revised um, graphic that came up. And then these, we're not going to dig into the details of this, but these next three slides just show you the different targets against the different building types. So this is domestic buildings, so homes that you'd be most familiar with. And you can see you've got pink, which is kind of where we are now. This 2025 target, which is ideally as a bare minimum, what should be being designed for. And then we've got the 2030 targets, which are ideally what we should be designing for. And you can see these numbers get lower, the operational uh, energy per square meter per year comes down, embodied carbon reduces, potable water usage reduces, and there's a whole load of kind of look up things you can do here. And this is just in the document, I literally just stripped this graphic straight out of the version two document. So you've got houses here, you've got new build schools, um, as, as different metrics, uh, so they, they've done potable water usage by pupil per year, as opposed to per person in a house per year, and those numbers are far, far lower. Uh, and the embodied carbon values are, well, they're, they're, they're a more steeper reduction. And then the third one here is, is about new build offices. <clears throat> so again, loads and loads of numbers, and then it just varies depending on um, you know, different building uses. And these were, I think the RIBA reviewed these in line with a lot of the work that Letty, so the London Energy Transformation Initi Initiative were doing, particularly around embodied carbon. Um, it, all these figures were kind of slightly tweaked and adjusted. Um, it's still a relatively simple um, framework to follow. Uh, and, and as I say, it should be quite stabilized now until we find out more about embodied carbon and learn from some of the designs that have been executed. So <clears throat> that's REBA 2030 as a, as a kind of a general framework with some numbers in it and, and the updated version. Building regulations coming this year. Already, they're behind the times. The 2021 building regulations were already in 2022, which is not a good start, but better than 2013 regulations than where we kind of are at the moment. Um, so the main changes here are that in, in Part L, which is conservation of fuel and power. There's a Part F, which is around ventilation of buildings and part o, overheating. Now we'll we'll cover um, part F, there have been minor changes, nothing particularly that meaningful really. The, the main changes are in part L and the creation of part O, but it's these three things which we'll be focusing on in the new 2021 building regulations. And they're coming in 2022. So my, my understanding is, although I don't pretend to be a, uh, you know, know everything about building regulations is, you know, buildings that get um, granted permission, you know, kind of beyond that date will have to meet these new regulations. Everything granted permission before will just have to stick you know, if they decide to do so to the to the current regs. But this is coming in June, uh, I think the end of June this year. And that's been confirmed. So <clears throat> as far as the kind of the part L changes, this is uh, conservation of, of energy, primarily, what they're trying to do here is tighten both the fabric of the buildings, nothing massive, but tighten the fabric of the buildings so the dwelling, um, so the target emission rates are tighter for a notional building. And also to overall reduce the energy usage of the building through the use of renewable technology as well. And, and both of those, so tightening the building fabric but also screwing down um, overall by 31% as again, uh, the operational energy usage. And to help um, designers do this and, and execute this, there's also a new, finally, the new SAP 10 methodology, which will be released at the same time. So we, we'll have, we've got a separate slide, but slide on the SAP 10 methodology, but essentially it's a more intelligent way of factoring in renewable technologies and lights and, uh, electric showers and battery systems and things which you just can't do in, in a kind of a really meaningful way. So we'll cover that in a sec, but there's a new methodology for helping get you more detail and, and, and helping you meet those. It's far less of a blunt tool. Um, but primarily the, the way that drive this through fabric, the part L changes is, is changes. So reductions in U values in windows, uh, roof, your roof U value um, through wastewater heat recovery and solar PV. So solar PV is now mandated 
in a notional building. So if you're trying to um, even just even just do a kind of a run of the mill building, but they've got into the notional building quite a significant amount of solar PV that you've got to um, match or, or better when you're doing um, buildings. And that's a big, big change because that wasn't in the in the old regs. There was nothing to do with solar PV in the old notional building setup. So <clears throat> to put some numbers against this, wind now notional windows come down from 1.4 watts a square meter to 1.2. Uh, roofs now have to be designed, again, this is a notional building, so it's kind of area weighted averages, but now designed to 0.11 um, as opposed to 0.13 watts a square meter. Um, showers must have wastewater heat recovery um, on every single shower. Again, this is a, a notional building. And they've said for solar PV, the numbers that have to be put in for the building you're trying to beat um, is 40% of the building's ground floor area for solar PV. Now that, that that's a that's a big chunk. It actually surprised me when I had a look at that. But that's um, that that just goes to show you what impact they're trying to make um, on the uh, you know on reducing the the emissions rates even for for notional buildings. And then the. As I say to help us do this, there is a there is a refined SAP ten methodology, and one of the biggest um, helpers here in all of this is there's a massively reduced electricity carbon factor over the last. It's something ridiculous. Like over the last five years, the the UK grid has been decarbonized by about thirty percent, um, and that has that hasn't really been reflected at all in the current. Um, kind of standard assessment procedure methodology when we're doing SAP calcs and, and EPC ratings. So this new SAP 10 or 10.2 or whatever it's going to be will bring right, right down that carbon factor. So when you're putting in um, heat pumps, ground source, air source, they um, you can pick specific models as well, which give you a really, really accurate um, coefficient of performance for those. And you're not going to get penalised. You used to get penalised quite heavily for putting in electrical devices, but heat pumps, particularly, this is really going to move the needle quite considerably and help you get down your, um, you know, your, um, uh, you know, emissions targets for the for the buildings. So this is really to to, to help help designers put put heat pumps in buildings and, and get great scores. There is new. Um, further refinement on kind of lighting details and, and actually the brightness of, of, um, of, of lights that you put in. So you can go to the, the detail of saying, you know, throughout a building, we're putting in something which is, um, you know, kind of less energy intensive, as well as just saying they're LED, you can go to the kind of the next level and that helps you um, with, with po energy points. Um, you can include batteries, as of June in your SAP calculations, as well as solar diverters. So again, it's picking up those extra little efficiencies that those, those systems bring. Um, you can now put in individual shower flow rates rather than just a, a nominal flat rate for showers. Uh, electric showers have, have been added in. As I say, wastewater heat recovery is more prominent. So if you put those devices on the outlets of your showers, you'll get more points. And the, I mean, the psi values and thermal bridge calculations are already uh, penalised quite heavily in the SAP calculations, and that will be more so the case. So unless you have done proven psi calculations for thermal bridges, you'll get massively penalised on, 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 on default bridge um, the default bridge, uh, you know, uh, entries that you put into into SAP. So again, this is really an encouragement to do more design due diligence uh, to to really make sure that uh, uh, you know they, those details are, are put in, calculated, and accurately recorded in the uh, in the energy um, SAP calculations. So quite a quite a few things there, and I think this will make quite a quite a big difference. The other big change is overheating. So this is a whole new section to building regulations. And whereas um, within um, SAP calculations, you used to have an overheating risk, which was high, medium or low, that's being stripped out of SAP calculations. And, and you have to meet this part of the building regulations. So it's a brand new, brand new section. Um, it applies, I was gonna say it applies to residential build, buildings only. It does, 
but you can have multiple occupancy residential buildings. So it covers flats and, and, and things like that. And you can have these buildings joined with commercial buildings. But this is really to, again, improve the due diligence that goes into designing blocks of flats, one-off homes, those kinds of things. And you could, there's two ways to show you're compliant against this standard. One is what you call a simplified method. And the other one is through using dynamic thermal modeling, which is kind of building, building physics modeling. And um, as I say, I'm not gonna delve into loads and loads of detail here, but one of the ways that you are allowed to use the simplified method, which I guess is the cheaper method, is you can either prove that by um, percentage of glazing on certain facades of the building is below a certain percentage threshold of the overall wall area, and the other one is that you've got openable windows on opposite sides of a room, not on necessarily on uh, on walls that are, per are perpendicular to one another. But if you can if you can show that you've got opening windows that allow true cross ventilation through a building, um, that will allow you to qualify for doing these kind of simplified calculations. Um, and they've got all kinds of tables that show you the allowable areas and what you can and can't do. If the design doesn't meet that criteria, like for example, you're trying to push the glazing on a particular facade, then you will have to show that you've done TM59 calculations. Um, again, for those of you who've worked with us before, you'll be familiar that, that that's something which we're able to provide. And again, just make sure that enough due diligence is given to designs that are, um, you know, not, not so straightforward to, to just prove that, you know, building comfort can be um, retained year round for that particular dwelling and they're quite good they've actually said um because you can kind of get lost in in the maze with um dynamic thermal modeling they've actually said how the window should be modeled to be open for domestic dwellings and all kinds so it's actually quite tightly bound um and and leaves very little for interpretation which is uh, which is which is no bad thing so um we're really really pleased to to see this overheating um section added to the to the regs i think it's really a really really smart move so <clears throat> when we look at reba 2030 and the current regs we have reba 30 big tick against all of these four sections operational energy usage in the new regs absolutely we can understand how that compares to reba 2030 in body carbon not so much. There's there's nothing in the new regs about embodied carbon, so there's there's, there's it's not a great deal of, of point direct comparing them absolutely directly. Um, water usage, kind of, and I'll explain explain that a bit later. And ventilation and over, overheating, absolutely, you can compare uh, how those two align, and and that's what I'll, I'll explain in the kind of the next few slides. So when we look at operational energy, and then operational energy is the most obvious one, really. It's the one we've got most data about. And what I thought I'd do here is just a, a really, really kind of simple graphic that, that shows you. So on the far left-hand side, we've got um, today's uh, standards. And on the far right-hand side is essentially net zero carbon um, design. <clears throat> so as we move from left to right, I'll show you how you know, how um, some of these new regulations, how Reba Climate Challenge, how Future Home Standard fit uh, proportionally into these various reductions. So this is where we're going with the new building regs. We're looking at a 31% um, overall operational energy reduction. So again, you know, quite a, quite a sizable move away from where we are. The London plan, which typically sits 30% ahead of the, the current regulations, that's moved, you know, it was at 30%, it's now going to be pushed to around the 60, 61% um, because they always tend to be 30% ahead of building regulations. And the future home standard is all the way over here. So it's around about 65, 70% reduction mark on current regs. So this is where, this is where the UK government <coughs> is trying to aim for for the middle of the decade. So you can see this is a quite an obvious play. So the, the current regs at the moment are sitting halfway in between where we are today and where we're going to be by the middle of the decade. And in the middle of the decade, then a new set of regs will come out and, and meeting that future home standard will be the new normal. So you, you can kind of see where they're, you can see where they're going with this. So Reba 2030, well, before I say that, passive house actually. So passive house, just, just for interest, this is where the kind of the passive house versions sit. So you've got passive house classic, 
And then you've got Passive House Plus and Passive House Premium. Again, not going to dive into those, but just, just to kind of help you figure out where they sit. That's where they are on the scale. So <clears throat> the REBA, what they're calling the REBA business as usual climate challenge target is sh just shy of where the new regs are going to be. And this is what they're telling you not to design to. This is the 2025 climate challenge target, which they're saying as a minimum now, you guys should be designing to. And the REBA 2030 target is here, well ahead of the future home standard, pushing about 76% reduction in today's current regs. So that's quite, you know, this was the kind of the simplest way that I could show this. And hopefully this helps. It shows you that industry has understood that current regs just are, you know, they're, they're way behind the curve here. And, uh, and we really need to be pushing well, well ahead. So if you're designing to 2025 today and can quite quickly design to 2030, you'll be well set up for any standards that come in in the middle of the decade. And I'm sure given, you know, that I, I know the, the kind of project you guys get involved in, that, that won't be that tri tricky at all. So the next one up is water usage. Um, this one, is where we're sitting at the moment. So this is kind of current current regs, which sits about 125 litres per person per day. Um, most councils at the moment are asking for about 110 litres per person per day when you do the Part G calculations. This is where the RIBA business as usual sits, which isn't really good enough. This is where the 2025 climate challenge sits, which is 95 litres per day. Now, this gets quite tricky. If any of you guys have been involved in Part G water calculations, which I'm sure you have done, you know, um, once you start putting in baths and stuff like that, you know, 95 litres per person per day is a, is a tricky target to hit. And this is where the Reba 2030 climate challenge is, 75 litres per person per day. So although it's not talking about massive gains, this actually has quite an interesting knock-on effect to the overall design process and some of the outlets um, and, and, and areas that consume water within the building. And then for health and well-being, um, this is what we've got. Uh, sorry, this is what we've got at the moment. So in the REBA 2030 Climate Challenge, it's broken down into all kinds of funny numbers, but I'll focus on two really. One is the overheating. So the climate challenge is talking about um, for domestic dwellings, 25 to 28 degrees Celsius, a maximum of 1% of occupied hours that the buildings and buildings occupy. Um, and then this 900 parts per million, um, again, pretty useless as a, a number, um, but I'll, 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 I, can, I can tell you now that 900 parts per million is is just kind of healthy, healthy parts per million of CO2. Um, and, and that, that doesn't that doesn't really change as the standards change. Now, when we compare that to where the regs are at the moment, we have um, when those come in in June. So REBA 2030 is asking for a maximum of 1% within this temperature range for the occupied hours. The overheating standard for 2021 is less than 3%. Now, it's not it's not a, a dead linear relationship. You only have to tweak some very, very small things to get from less than 3% overheating to less than 1%. So the new regs are, are behind the 2030 standard and the 2030, 2030 standard for overheating is more progressive um, than the new regs coming out. Um, the good news is even the current Part F ventilation standards and with new MVHR technology um, being increasingly put into buildings, the, the, the 2030 CO2 standard here of less than 900 parts per million is just good ventilation and the current regs are, you know, are, are there and thereabouts with it. In fact, in the current regs, they don't even talk about um, those kind of ventilation rates. Um, but there, there's nothing to there's nothing to to change for, for ventilation, really, as far as we can see. So how does this affect real world? It's fine talking about, oh, well, this standard's better than that standard, or that standard's about the same as the other. But how does this actually affect real world U values or technologies in buildings as far as we can see? So I've done these really, really simple tables here, which look at your, your columns, you've got the different REBA standards and the building regulations. And then down the left here, we've got walls, roofs, walls openings, air tightness, stuff like that. So <clears throat> at the moment, when we look at operational energy, 
this is this far left hand column um, here is kind of kind of where we are. So notional U vannies for buildings. Um, it should actually this this should actually be one point four rather than one point two. I'll adjust that after. Um, you know you've got an air tightness of five gas boiler. You, know, you don't really need any solar. Um, maybe a bit if they're asking for a ten percent um, renewables production and kind of mechanical ventilation. The new regulations, as we discussed, the roof view values are going to have to come down. Um, the windows will come down from what should be 1.4 to 1.2. Air tightness isn't changing, actually. They haven't demanded that a notional building should have any tighter air tightness standard, which is a bit surprising. But in order to meet these um, energy reductions, we're going to have to start putting in air and ground source technology into almost every home. You're, you can still um, get away with the mechanical ventilation. They're not enforcing, you because of this air tightness target, you haven't got to put in MVHR. Uh, but your solar, all of a sudden, you're going to have to start putting solar on, on most buildings if you can, uh, can do at all. The 2025 target tightens uh, quite um, aggressively. <clears throat> and um, we believe, and this is all based on projects that we've done. So air tightness really needs to be sub three, ideally sub two. So you've got mechanical ventilation, heat recovery, you've got heat pumps, you've got a bit more solar on there. And then really to meet the 2030 target standards, which are around the kind of the passive house mark, you're at 0 0.1, 0.11 for walls and roofs. You're in, into kind of triple glazing territory, air tightness of less than one, mechanical heat recovery, solar, more solar batteries. Uh, and you're really kind of loading the, loading the kind of the projects up there in order to meet that quite stringent, um, stringent operational energy target. So hopefully that kind of gives you a, a better idea of the way that you might map buildings to get somewhere close. Water usage. Um, this is, I've, I've used this slide before, so I don't know if any of you have seen this one. Really at the moment, you know, hitting the, the current regs, low flow taps and dual flush toilets, you could probably kind of get away with to meet the, the 125 litres per day. To meet most typical council requirements of 110, yeah, fine, you know, you try and make sure predominantly You've got mainly showers in the in the building. You can have low volume baths. You've still got low flow taps and dual flush toilets, but you're you're not putting baths in in every single room. Really, to hit the 2025 target, you need to be putting in rainwater harvesting to get down towards 95 liters per day. And really, to go further again to the 2030 targets, you're you've got to strongly consider whether you should even have a bath in a property. And I know this causes some um you know discussion between designers particularly as you're trying to design homes for maybe end of life or you know us brits do love a bath and um, that becomes really really tricky um and so you know yes things will get more efficient but as far as i'm aware by the end of the decade people aren't going to get smaller so it's likely the bath volumes may well stay the same um, so it's, it's as we get down to the thin end of the wedge here for water usage, um, that there's, there's some interesting scenarios to, to play around with in order to kind of tick the water usage box. And although water usage, given um, it's, rel it's relatively kind of trivial, um, what's the word, trivial, kind of part when you compare it to figuring out what the fabric of the building is going to be and how much whether we're going to put a heat pump in or solar and stuff it is one of the more difficult design decisions really to hit the 2030 target and out of all the out of all the projects that we've done that have met 2030 targets almost all of them fail on this 20 on the potable water usage one a lot of them hit the 2025 just but very, 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 very few actually hit the 2030 target. So there's some work to do here. Um, and you can, you know, there are things to consider like grey water harvesting on top of rainwater harvesting, but that adds cost and is it really worth it? But so it, it's worth as, as, as you uh, do this, having a, a think about some of the design options and how the calculations are working, see if we can screw that down. And then health and well-being. I actually broke this into two parts, I think. Um, I think we've got ventilation and overheating here. So ventilation-wise, if we stick with the current Part F guidelines, although there are going to be some slight tweaks to Part F, um, a colleague of mine, David Reed, in a couple of weeks' time is doing an entire CPD on the changes to Part F regs. Uh, so do, do check that one out. But really, where we are, where we are with healthy ventilation in buildings, um, 
is around about the kind of the 900 or less than 900 parts per million CO2 criteria anyway. So that hasn't really got to change. What does change, though, is as we get into the realms of mechanical ventilation and heat recovery, because you've then got almost every single room either being supplied with air or having extract air taken out from it, it, it leaves, you know, it's far more wholesome ventilation around the whole building rather than just for wet areas, just for utility rooms, just for, um, you know, bathrooms and, uh, you know, stuff like that, which more traditional mechanical ventilation ventilates, uh, you know, kitchens and, and things like that. So, <clears throat> again, when we look at the various targets and where we are today, business as usual, fine, uh, an air tightness of five cubic metres per square metres per hour, um, building regs, still say a notional building can have that as a target. But as you move into 2025 and 2030, you really need to get into MVHR, MVHR territory pretty quickly. Um, and, and the CO2 concentrations don't change. So this is really about build quality, detailing and improved whole house ventilation to tick this kind of uh, ventilation box. And ultimately this is gonna help you with your operational energy. Um, as, as well uh, figures and overheating um, this one is, is slightly more abstract um, but bear with us there's a, there's a lot more um, dynamic factors that come into quantifying overheating but <clears throat> the key things here are just more rigorous cross ventilation design making sure buildings have more opening windows where they can have them where it suits opening roof lights for nighttime purge ventilation um, and just properly considered southeast and west facade glazing. Um, I know, you know, that there's been a, a push for a long, long time to try and increase the amount of glazing, particularly we have views and some lovely rural properties. And, and I, I think what this is really telling us as designers to do is um, there's no problem doing that, but you've just got to do more rigorous analysis at an early stage to make sure that you're not just shooting yourself in the foot because you've come up with this great concept, but from an overheating point of view, it's it, it, it's too too far out. We need to kind of restrain um, some of the design parameters to make sure it's actually habitable um, year round. And again, the way that I've tried to summarise this uh, as best as I can do at the moment in SAP calculations, you've got you're aiming for a medium or low overheating risk. Um, building regulations coming up this year suggest a, a less than three percent overheating risk. Uh, and really by the 2030 target, you've got to get less than 1%. But this is, this is by no means linear. It's not three times the amount of design effort to get to the 2030 target. Sometimes it just can be the, the minutest of, of changes and, and, and details. And the only way you pick this up is by doing thermal modeling. You can't do this with a, um, a simplified kind of method and spreadsheet. You are going to have to make thermal modeling are kind of a fundamental part of concept, conceptual and developed design um, in order to get this feedback on your, on your designs. So in summary, um, the new regs are coming and they're coming fast. June will be upon us very, very quickly. Uh, there's now a new, a brand new overheating requirement, which is far more rigorous. Overall, our buildings have to see a 31% reduction in operational energy and building usage. Uh, particularly cross ventilation and glazing restraint must be um, observed and is strongly suggested. Dynamic thermal modeling really will, will rapidly become best practice and, and getting that um, balance right between an appropriate level of analysis and, and cost is, is always a, a worthwhile discussion to have with a client um, going forward and just seeding in the mind that that might be uh, well worth their, their money at the early stages. Um, quite clearly, the new regs are significantly lagging behind the RIBA challenge and, and overall design community sentiment. So if, you're, um, if you like the idea of the REBA challenge and, and, and you're prepared to just tweak a few of the design uh, elements of your buildings, you've got nothing to worry about against the new regulations. And um, yeah, holistic design of buildings, which include embodied carbon, which include water usage, which include um, you know, overheating and ventilation and stuff, they will easily beat, e easily beat the, the, the new regs. And that, and my final point, I thought that was it. Final point is, um, yeah, I, I mean, just more targeted and, and considered early stage design. This is part of a wider conversation that we need to have between our, our, ourselves as kind of um, strategic partners and with the client to try and unlock a bit more of the project budget at those earlier stages just to make sure that the design risk is minimized 
and um, you know clients can sleep well and we can sleep well knowing that what we're doing is is, is not going to have to be backtracked uh, against uh, at later stages and that's me that's me folks that's me uh, that's me done have you guys got any um any questions on that at all thanks doug that was a really good presentation i thought um uh, it, it was great that it sort of looked not only at the 2021 standards, but more broadly at, at, at all the other standards at the moment and what's what's coming our way. Because um, it's important not to just be blinkered on the 2021, but to see it as much as part of a much bigger sort yeah. of move. Um, yeah. So that was great. And then the way you sort of then broke it down into tables and compared, um, you know, what that actually means. And it's interesting to see the sort of cliff edge um, beyond 2021, I think the was it 2025 RBA targets, where, where suddenly the E-values for walls went down from 0.18 to 0.11 or something. I mean, that's... Yeah, I mean, be... you've got to be, you, you know, you're, you're basically at, at passive house-esque standards of, obviously, only passive house regulates all well, the minimum standards, you know, 0.15, but... Because um... that's, that, that's the one that I kind of see as being perhaps one of the bigger challenges for the industry, particularly for developer-led schemes where, you know, already we're having to use non-combustible insulation, which is thicker because of fire eggs, mm. you know, so for a typical block of flats now, your external wall thickness is, you know, up to 500 mil or something. Mm. You then you then look at <laughs> stretching, that you're going to end up with sort of these walls that are sort of 750 mil thick or something. And if you're looking at high rise or, or anything, it's going to, it's going to yeah. be a real challenge for the industry, yeah. I can see. The, it, um, it's kind of, it, as I say, it's, it's funny because we, yeah, I mean, the walls will have to get thicker, you know, and, and, and as we try and go away from more man-made materials or we have to be smarter about the materials, um, but there are some laws of physics that we'd love to, to, mm. to bend, but suddenly we can't, you know, we can't magically triple the density of, of something or, or something man-made can't, mm. you know, can't necessarily be the same thickness as something that's been through a huge amount of processing in a, in a chemical factory and, and reliant on petrochemicals as we used to. So there has, there has to be some give and take. I mean, I guess one of the advantages <clears> of, <throat> of thicker walls, given that we're trying to reduce overheating and improve, I guess, the thermal inertia of buildings is that works in, in our favor. If we can add thicker, you know, thicker walls, yes, you know, fine. Somebody overall may lose a few square meters of habitable space in a 300 square meter home <laughs> it's mm -hmm. gonna be, um, you know, that, that building becomes a more stable environment to, mm -hmm. in, in which to live and, and, you know, lightweight construction, generally speaking, is, is, is kind of cheaper and, and it's, uh, you know, it's no, it's no bad thing because it, it, does, it does get us thinking. And, and I, I firmly believe, I think this decade is gonna be full of innovation you know, once you're up against those strong challenges, yeah, there's a lot of money in solving those innovation problems, both for embodied carbon, both for how can man-made products perform as well as, mm. you know, petrochemical-based products that we've been used to for the last 50 years. And some pretty cool stuff will happen. Some great, great products, I think, will hit the market yeah. and systems. And that, that, that's for all of us to look forward to. But yeah, it, it appears... It appears like there's a long way to go, but actually, surprisingly, with the moving come out technology the and, and change in our working processes, it's going to be a fascinating place to be because I think there's actually just some really, really small tweaks to what we do every single day, and, and we'll become you know far more enlightened as design teams and uh, and, and learn very, very rapidly. And, and in two, three years' time, we, we won't be able to believe that we used to design the way we did three years ago and it won't, won't necessarily be any harder we'll just be mm. you know, moving <laughs> moving on um, faster yeah. and making making more progress yeah no I, th I think you're right innovation has to happen yeah and and it, and it is you can see it you can see it oozing out of the, the industry at the moment and it's uh yeah I, I think there's sufficient amounts of rigor that people increasingly now can see through the kind of the green washing of products and mm. um demanding that epds are produced for embodied carbon you know that the whole life impacts of you know new materials that are coming out mm. to make sure they are genuinely not only innovative but <laughs> lower impact than uh you know the, than the things they're they're replacing um yeah that's cool uh were there I, any other were, were there any other yeah doug, doug sorry i was late to the meeting i've been in london this morning and no, fine. Back, in, back in high um it's interesting your point about innovation because um there's kind of there's a bit of a movement at the moment in amongst architects for low tech, mm -hmm. um, yep. and that I wonder where that sort of sits because obviously not all elements can be low tech. Your AV and your IT and all that sort of stuff can't be low tech. But 
there is cer certainly a movement to move away, move back to sort of how we used to build out of stone and timber. Um, and uh, and they're call sort of calling it low tech on the basis that actually, it, you know, the, the whole, I guess it's the, the role reverse of high, the high tech era. Um, it hasn't really caught mainstream yet. I think there's a number of people trying to do it, whether it will or not, I don't, whether it will catch on or not, I don't know. But that, that's, it, that's interesting too, people sort of looking backwards rather than forwards for materials to use. Yeah, I think, I think there's an elegance, there's a, there's a, a, a I can't remember which um, presentation it was that I did, but I actually had the, had the slide with the iPhone on it. Um, and my, the, the point that I was making in a previous um, presentation was, was exactly that, really actually to create something dead impressive, aesthetically beautiful and, and highly, highly functional. There's, as we all know, there's almost more work in, in creating something more elegant and, and simple than there is complex and misshapen and, and you know, can stuff bulk and just like organically just like bolting stuff on. Um, and, and, and I would agree with you. I think, I think particularly when it comes to um, ventilation of buildings and well, I mean, even just with ventilation buildings, just talk about that for a sec, because, you know, passive stack ventilation and, and the discussion around overheating, the amount of ferociously um, complex technical systems that I've seen, mm. not least bolting on a whopping great big air conditioning system to a mm. highly glazed building to keep it cool in the summer is, is crazy for a number of reasons, in, in upgrading the infrastructure, capital cost, running costs, um, of, of running the aircon system and you ask them about why they haven't put any roof lights in the building oh yeah. well, you know we didn't want to break the roof line um or yeah, yeah. You know, no, nobody would see those skylights but it's, it's it's done now you know we can't put a roof light in <laughs> we can't put yeah. an opening roof light in the scene but we all know how effective you know atriums are and and that that um stack effect that effect yeah, yeah the, mm -hmm. the, the stack effect of letting hot air out and and that's um that's such a simple thing to do. Yeah. When, you, when you look at the cost of a project, you could easily add, in particular, if you want to do a subtle aircon system, you could easily add 30, 40 grand. Yeah. To... I, guess, I guess the dilemma with natural ventilation is um, we, we've always promoted natural ventilation, you know, for, for years, even before Napier Clark, we've always been working on that um, mm. idea. But when you're in the city, obviously you need a double facade in order for that to work. Yes. Yeah. And then, and then yeah. that's the, the expense, the expense mm -hmm. of the double facade versus mm -hmm. the expense of AC mm -hmm. is, is, you know, it's, cl it's clear that the, the developers will just do a closed building yeah. and put AC in, you know, most, most would anyway, yeah. unless you're Renzo Piano and you can convince your client to, um, to put a double facade in. We just, I just come back from a meeting where uh, we had a big debate about basements because, um, it's for it's for a, a an estate owner who owned most of St John's Wood, and they um, and we're working with the Telia Ten on it, and um, and Patrick Belly was party to the meeting, and he, he was sort of, you know, the only way we can possibly make the scheme viable is if we put basements in part of it, mm -hmm. from a financial point of view. But he was like he was like obviously dead against it because it's the most um, unenvironmental thing you can do in terms of having to shift all the soil and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a big, a big debate about that. It went on for about half an hour, <laughs> and then there was a debate about natural ventilation alongside that. So this, mm -hmm. this estate owner said, "Well, we don't have AC in any of our. I mean, they own a lot of property. They mm -hmm. don't have any AC mm -hmm. in any of their property." Mm -hmm. And and we said, "Yeah, we'll try. We would love to promote natural ventilation, and they're, they're they're fine with that." But then then we then had this discussion. Well, what happens when the new regs come in? You know, will that will that influence in terms of overheating? Will that influence how we have to design the building? Which I'm sure it will. We'll have to end up putting a lot more Brie Soleil on buildings or retractable blinds or whatever it might be um, to, 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 to deal with that. I mean, there is a big, you know, and, and this is worth uh, bearing in mind if you're not familiar with um, kind of how to solve overheating or if you've come across overheating issues before. But th there are two general rules. And one is... Um, Overheat, overheating during the day is, is generally about thermal mass of the building. Um, generally speaking, it doesn't, doesn't matter what orientation it is. Of course, you know, if you've gone silly with the amount of glazing, that, that can have a disproportionate effect. But generally speaking, thermal mass is, is, your, is your friend when it comes to daytime overheating. But nighttime overheating is, is all about purge ventilation 
and being able to let all that daytime air out of the building. Um, and if you if you bear that in mind, you can solve a lot of the issues. Um, yeah, at least kind of heading down the right road in in the start. But it's you know this is the, the new part over the regs. It's great because it's that level of due diligence that we now that we now need in in those buildings to really design properly. That, that there's been a lot of corner cutting and and particularly from developers, and it just gets us thinking about smarter and and hopefully simpler decisions. Even though yes, we may lose. A bit of floor area because walls are thicker it may solve a load of problems that otherwise you would have had to throw technology at or you know do those other kinds of things and uh, you know uh, developers once they realize that they're going to be able to sell these buildings at a premium even though they've got a smaller footprint um you know net internal yeah. area they'll, they'll they'll soon forget about the fact that the walls are a bit thicker yeah I, I, sorry i missed your presentation what was your feeling on lightweight because lightweight buildings are obviously quick and easy to put up prefabrication, yep. et cetera, mm -hmm. but they don't have the sort of the, 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 the weight of the masonry, possibly if you put mm -hmm. concrete in, concrete mm -hmm. full of embodied carbon, depending mm -hmm. upon if you use a not, but you could use, I mean, we talked again earlier today about non cementitious concrete um, yeah. uh, and, and yeah. the opportunity there, obviously more expensive, but if you don't have that either stone or um solidity of a of concrete or whatever you don't have the thermal mass for mediation at night time um which we've often used before for mediation of temperature and then and then you're in a position where you you you're 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 you know what's better to have a concrete building or actually you no know, don't do a concrete building work on your sort of long-term in use carbon as opposed to your constructed carbon um um yeah i mean depending on you know there are obviously the, the there's a whole other discussion about the the kind of the Letty and the RIB embodied carbon targets and and the you know the Letty targets focus more on upfront carbon, um, whereas uh, you know the the Reba targets focus more on on whole you know almost kind of whole project carbon. Yeah. Um, so um, I mean I guess that's that's a decision to be made. We found particularly and I was looking at it the other day actually because I was working on the next revision of our embodied carbon calculator and. Um, have you guys come across these kind of clay boards, these high density clay boards? No. So they're like they're a bit like double density plasterboard, a bit like acoustic plasterboard, but it's not gypsum based. And we did work for a developer in London somewhere, maybe a couple of years ago, actually. And he failed his overheating um, for these flats. I think mean, like seven stories of flats or something. And he almost fell off his chair when he realized that having done some proper analysis, these things were going to overheat and they were going to be just timber frame construction. Yeah. And they started piling on site. And uh, we said to him, look, 90% of these flats are going to fail this TM59 overheating criteria. It was TM49, which is the London standard. They're going to fail this overheating criteria. He said, you've got to add some thermal mass. And he goes, we can't because um, we started piling and we're not going to stop piling. So, right, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. so, you know, what do you do? And we went away and we discovered they were having to double plasterboard for fire regs, the outer skin of the building anyway. Mm. And if they, rather than putting plasterboard on, if they put clay board on, which mm. has a lower global warming potential because it doesn't got gypsum in it, mm. same, um, at, at a higher density, and all of a sudden, Rather than ninety percent of the flats being non-compliant, ten percent of the flats were non-compliant just oh, by making that single change. And when we spoke, spoke to the structural engineer, it didn't affect the piling scheme whatsoever. Hmm. So it just goes to show, just just having a look at a, a slightly change, different yeah. material there, you know, made a made a radical radical difference. And in in that case, the embodied carbon of the construction was down. And, and solved his overheating issue, compliance issue. And most of the other non-compliance remaining was just about nighttime purge ventilation. So just about yeah, yeah, yeah. having wind. So, you know, some of these things can be really, really subtle, but if you don't, um, you know, analyze it in the first place, you, yeah. you, you don't know. And you can throw a load of money and kind of non-practical solutions at it, at it yeah. based on our, what is increasingly becoming kind of limited construction experience. Um, you know, things are changing very <laughs> rapidly now that you know we we got to kind of unlearn what we what we already know. So there's some it, it, it's great that this is forcing the discussion. Some of these changes in regs and some of these yeah. you know voluntary industry standards are 
are you know pushing us pushing us harder but i think it's easier than we think it's just, just... yeah i think i think so the the, the 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 problem is is that quite quite a lot of it is just logical change isn't it and actually it's just yeah. thinking logically about how you yeah. ventilate a building how you cross ventilate yeah. a building yeah. how you ventilate it with stack effect things like that mm. and then how you insulate it to mm. a higher level etc but mm. The problem that we'll, we'll have as a small practice, unless we, unless someone like yourself is involved, or Atelier Ten, or or, or uh, you know a, a, a service engineer, a sustainability engineer that's interested in environment, um, it, it's assessing it all because because the the REBA, for instance, with the award systems now, mm. not that it should mm. be about awards, but the award systems, anything over a million pounds in construction value, you have to show assessments for yep. uh, post occupancy. Mm. That's a nightmare because a lot of the buildings that we do, you know, um, not a lot, but a number of the buildings that we've done in the past are under a million pounds. Mm. And, uh, and, and so we didn't have to do that. But where it starts to get into the one-off house, which, which a lot more of our work is now, which is over a million pounds, we're now having to assess them. But quite a lot of those clients, they don't want to pay for, they don't want to pay, you know, they, they're, they're not like, um, albeit the Ballam client has been a very difficult client, you know, in a number of ways. Um, but they... You know, not many people pay the money that they they paid to do what they've done. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the interpretation of post occupancy evaluation would would surprise most. I, I think even um, simple sharing of um, of energy bills or doing some very 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 basic uh, analysis is is all the RIBA are after at the moment. So I mean, they, oh, they really so so it is actually it, it, it is what they would call light touch. So, okay. um, you know, what are the what are the energy bills after a year? Maybe a dead simple, you know, ten question survey about yeah know, how the people have got on with the building. I think that that counts as yeah. post occupancy. Just out of interest, um, Doug, if we've got buildings that you haven't worked on, but we would want to enter them for re awards, would you be willing to help us just get them over the line? Into we obviously yeah. So what what but, we but, have done, what we have done. I mean, the the, the, the tricky thing, yeah, the, the 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 tricky two areas are. What do we think the um, energy usage is per square meter um, yeah. a year? Operational energy, and, and if the clients can can share with you what their energy bills are, that's that's dead simple because yeah. real world data beats yeah um, computational data hands down. And you, and you can't you can't enter the awards now without the building being year year occupancy anyway. So um, yeah, you should yeah. have that information. Yeah. Um, and then in embodied carbon. I mean, what we've been doing on the embodied carbon front is we we've been using. Um, our calculator that we've put together you just share the plans bang the, the information into there and that's you know, okay. you know that's, as, that's yeah. as close as you're going to get and that's you know that's, that's accurate but, enough because a number of us schemes that we've finished i mean i think you've worked on 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 some of them but a, a number of them we didn't even have a service engineer i mean we've got one project where we've got mvhr we've got a air source heat pump etc going on and we've got lots of interesting sustainability things it's only a small new house, but mm. but we didn't have a service engineer. They just wouldn't pay for it. So it's like, um, yeah, yeah and, and and the chances are it could be overheating. I've got no idea, but um, I'm going to go and see it this uh, okay. next week. But, but we got but, a few. We got a few like that that would be quite useful. We can't enter them until next year. Yeah. Um, but when we do, it'd be quite useful to have someone like yourself just help us put together mm. the 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 information for the awards. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a. It, it's yeah. You know, it's it's dead cost effective. It doesn't it doesn't cost. Um, Probably any money at all to, to okay. dig that information out, and it, you know you've got the drawing pack, so yes, yeah, I'm sending that over. But yeah, it's that's okay. Good. Great. Go right. ahead, is, is, it, is it possible to share your presentation, or would you rather not? Yeah, no, no, I'm happy to do that. Anyth anything that we present um, is we're we're happy to share. So we'll send over we'll send over the recording. Um, I think Kat's off sick this afternoon, but I'll get to send it out tomorrow if she's back in. Yeah. And I'll send out the recording. We'll send over the presentation. Yeah, and yeah, free to to share that. And yeah, it'd be great because I I'd really like to see it, and obviously I missed it. So yeah, great. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Yes, great. Enjoy the rest of your day.